So my name is David Hay, and I'm going to be talking about profiling um, and I guess using Fire to help with that. So kind of show of hands, who's familiar with profiling in Fire? Right, okay. I'm going to be doing a bit of background stuff, which may or may not be new to you, but I'll go through it anyway. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions as they've, as they've come up, so do feel free to, um, uh, to ask anything that you, you want. So this is the second in a sort of series that we had. We started yesterday uh, when we were talking about a, a, a process that we're kind of looking at to, you know, to work with fire, to help clinicians work with fire. Got a picture on hand, who would regard themselves as a clinician? Yeah. In the minority, okay, right. I'm talking to you folk, that's the, that's the, the others, you know, I, I don't care about, I'm joking about them. Um, but as I said yesterday, I think that one of the things that FIRE does is, uh, is allows clinical and business type folk to become more involved in, in development of interoperability projects than has happened before through their previous standards. And so yesterday we talked about that overall uh, process and we talked about some of the basics of FIRE and we talked about some of the models that we would use uh, on the path to developing fire resources. Today what I'm going to do is going to pick up on that discussion, talk a little bit more about structured and coded data and what that means. We're going to go into profiling, why we do profiling, uh, the purpose of it, what are some of the artifacts that we need to do, and then I'll talk about some of the support that uh, the Clinfire has for that, and where, where Clinfire fits in the overall ecosystem of tooling. We've got a couple of sessions, this one and the one following. Uh, the idea of it is, is this is the kind of formal presentation bit, and I'll show you the bits and pieces, and then we'll overflow into the next one um, at and when we need to. So just a reminder that this was the overall process that we're talking about. And as I said yesterday, this is not an official fire process or anything like that. It's one that hasn't been tested in anger as yet, although we've got a few projects that are doing that. So very much open to uh, open to evolution and we'll see what happens. But the idea of it is we start with a clinical problem, we develop an information model which represents the data that we want to share. We then start to talk that, turn that into fire resources to, to represent the actual resources that will need to be involved. Uh, the resources model and the graph kind of work together. One's a, um, one's a model of the actual content and the graph is the relationships between them. And then we move on to the uh, fire, fire artifacts themselves. And the purpose behind this sort of process uh, is sort of represented by those arrows. So the idea is that the clinician, the business analyst, can be involved uh, deeply in the beginning and then sort of less so as it becomes more fire specific. Whereas the fire expert um, and the terminologist doesn't need to be involved quite so much up front, but they bring their expertise in later on. So we, we, we have a, a, an opportunity for both clinical and for technical people to become involved. And so what we're talking about today is that last little arrow. Now, although I've represented this as a like a linear uh, progression, I, I would think that there's going to be anything but, and like any kind of project, we're going to have feedback from the various stages. So you can imagine, for example, it's um, having developed a, an information model, and then you go and do your resources that might feed back into your information model, and so on and so forth. Um, so just talking about profiling in general and why we do profiling and the purpose of it. And the main thing is that there's many different what we call contexts in healthcare. By context, what I mean is places where we record data uh, about healthcare delivery. Um, so for example, if we want to say do a blood pressure, we might have different sets of data that we want to capture if we're doing it in the GP office compared to an intensive care. But we want to be able to use the same set of resources for both. We want to constrain our number of resources. But in fact, we want to be able to describe the usage of fire based on the context that we're using it in. And then being able to, once we can sort of do that description, we then want to be able to have these things, have these descriptions, if you like, in a structured sort of way. We want to be able to find them, we want to be able to publish them, and we also want to be use, them as the, use them as the basis for validation. And I think you, if you've been to some of the sessions uh, so far, yesterday and today, you'll see that people have been talking about using some of the uh, underlying stuff for validation. Uh, less so for UI generation, but that's what, uh, that's what Clinfire, as an example, does. And when you're talking about profiling, I sort of call out three main aspects. These are by no means the only things that you can do with profiling. Profiling in FHIR gets really, really kind of complicated. And remember that this sort of presentation is aimed at the, at the clinical level rather than the technical level. But three things that you can do is, first is you can take an existing resource type and you can constrain it. 
So you can take out the elements that your use case doesn't need. You can um, change things like multiplicity. So something might be uh, optional in the, the core fire spec, you might want to make it required. Um, it might allow for multiple elements, you might want to say only one, and so forth. So constraining resource is the first thing that you do. The second is to change the binding for a coded element. We're going to talk about that a little bit um, coming up. But that's where you can say that in the spec it says that for this particular code, here are the permissible values. Your use case may well be different. If you take a condition resource, for example, if you're using a condition resource to represent data in an ED, there might be a different set of values that you commonly see uh, from, say, a GP practice or from a surgical uh, practice. And then the third thing that you do with profiling is to add a new element, to add an extension. And anyone who's used Fire for a while will realise that when it was designed, it was designed with the idea that only the core stuff was in the, uh, in the, in the core specs. Only the most commonly used elements were present. And that was a very deliberate policy to keep the resources themselves small and simple and easy to use. We kind of went the other way in V3 and threw everything in there and became completely unmanageable. So extensions are where you take the, the basic set and you add in the other bits that you need for your use case. And our expectation is that any real use of fire will need extensions. So if there's nothing wrong, there's an expectation. So in effect what we're saying is that profiling is the way that you take fire and you adapt it to a specific use case. It's a statement of usage. It says how you are using fire in your particular scenario. And so here are some of the examples, again, based on what I've just been talking about. So that's obviously a, um, a patient resource in the specification. And you can see over on the left-hand side there, uh, the name is, a, is um, uh, optional or multiple. You might want to say that you know, just have one name. Marital status there is coded. You might want to have a different set. In your, in your domain, you might have a different set of marital statuses than in the spec. Or sort of I, I suppose I should say. Um, up there on the right hand side there, there's the identifier again is, is, um, is multiple. You might want to say that it uses a particular uh, national identifier. So that's going to be one of the really common uses of this, and we're sort of seeing this in a number of the profiles that have been developed, where you want to say that the identifier must be the national identifier, or at least one of the identifiers must be. You might want to say that we don't support photos, and you might want to add an extension. So that's kind of a summary of the sort of things that you uh, might do when you are profiling a resource. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about three sort of main aspects. I'm going to follow that theme through. So I'm going to talk a little bit about coded data and identifiers. Um, and I'm going to talk in particular about this concept of binding to a value set, because it's a really important concept if you're, if you're profiling. I'm going to talk about extensions. I'm going to talk about actually creating the profile itself. Uh, and then I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about the implementation guide and what that, what that is. So I'm going to start with structured encoded data. The first thing I'm going to do is talk about what the difference between the two actually is. So structured data is where you have, if you like, predefined slots in your resource for something to go. So if we're talking about a patient, for example, you have a place for the name, you have a place for the address, you have a place for the date of birth. <coughs> if it's a condition, you might have a place for the, for the code to go, a place for the patient, and so on and so forth. So you can think of structured as being one step better than just plain text, because at least you know where bits are. Coded data, on the other hand, is where you take a particular element and you say its value comes from a terminology. Uh, and coded information really is where we want to get to. As much as possible, we want coded data, because it greatly improves the quality of the exchange. It's this whole concept of, you might have heard of semantic interoperability, where the meaning of what you're trying to uh, exchange becomes a lot more explicit. And it also enables a number of secondary uses. Uh, decision support is a very common one that's occurring more and more uh, these days. Analytics, particularly population health and reporting, again, if we don't have coded data, but at least structured, preferably coded, we simply cannot do these things. And more and more, particularly delivery of healthcare, is becoming uh, more and more imperative that we have tooling that supports the clinician, rather than expecting them to be able to uh, remember everything themselves. This is the, uh, uh, a, an example of, the, of a resource from the specification. Uh, this is a patient resource. And if you look at the, this is this is a common representation that you'll see in quite a few profiles and, um, uh, around the world. And so you have a, a tree-like structure there because the resources are by themselves hierarchical. Uh, you have the name of the element there down that left-hand side. Uh, 
then the next column is the flags, and that's got things that are, are about each particular item. So the little sigma sign means it's included in the summary, the little question mark means it's a modifier element, and so forth. Then you have the cardinality, or how many can appear, uh, the minimum, a couple of dots, and the maximum. Uh, there are some rules around cardinality changes in the profile. You can't, for example, take something which is required in a specification and make it optional. You can't take something which is single in the spec and make it multiple. But you can do the opposite. You can take something which is multiple and make it single. You can take something which is optional and make it required. If you're doing profiling, think about what you're trying to do. If you make something required, it means I cannot send you something if you don't have this data. That's not always what you want to do. You might want to be able to you might want to indicate that you really would like this stuff. But if you, for example, make an identifier required or a name required, you're raising the bar to profitability. You can do it, but just be cautious about it when you are doing it. The next the next thing across there is the data type. We'll talk about that in just a second, and then you have a bit of a comment down the uh, on the on the right hand side. So this is how you read the spec. So I was talking about data types, and again, touched on data types in the session last week, um, yesterday, feels like a week ago, you understand, sometimes. Um, as you may or may not recur, there was, there was a scurrilous rumour that I mucked up my, my timetable and arrived late yesterday, quite, quite untrue, quite untrue. But I slept today, so I feel much better. Um, data types, you can think actually of a resource almost like a bag of data types. The, the, the data types are the fundamental blocks that in turn make up the, uh, make up the resources. And uh, we're going to look at some of them in just a second. I'm going to call out just a couple that you'll see. You're going to see something that says a backbone element, and you'll see that down there uh, under contact. And that's, that's used when you've got like a, a, another layer down the tree. And so it's not in, the, in and of itself, it doesn't contain data, but you can see there the contact has got, underneath the contact is relationship. You can have multiple contacts, each of which will have a relationship there. The other one that I'll just point out to no, it does, it does work. There we go. Is this concept over here? You see this guy there with the X. So we call that a choice element. And what that actually means is that for this property called deceased, it can actually have two different data types. It can either be a boolean, deceased yes no, uh, or it can be a date time, the date that they are deceased. And what you'll see in the natural instance is that the name will contain that data type. You can only have one of them. You can't have both. So you can't, for example, have deceased boolean and deceased date time in the, uh, in the resource for very obvious reasons. Um, I'm going to talk about identifiers in just a second because they're important. I'm going to look at um, coded data. So this, in data types we think of them as actually two different sorts. The first are primitive data types. Um, this is, well this is actually it's not quite from the spec, we made it look like a little bit prettier. But you can see that these are things like, uh, from the top left there, an instance in time, time itself, date, boolean, and so forth. So these are your basic, basic data types. Now, do you generally have a value of some sort? It's based on the W3C schema, although it's simplified. Again, following this, uh, this keep it simple um, uh, set property. The one thing I will draw your attention to, if you see the elements box in just a second there, in the, in the middle there, it's got an extension. So you can create extensions against data types if you want to. And you will often do that, I think it's been done in the Netherlands, for example, for things like a name. You want to add other properties to, to a name. Here we have the complex data types. Uh, and a complex data type has got child elements. Uh, and again, as we pointed out yesterday, some of the most important ones uh, are the coded ones at the top there, so the codable concept. Um, we've got coding, sample data. Again, you don't need to know all of these things, but it's useful to know what they are and where to find them in the spec. One of the really cool things about Fire is that it's hyperlinked up the wazoo. Pretty much everything is a hyperlink. If you go into the spec and, and click on something, chances are it will take you to a description of what it is. And the data types are the same. You go into a resource, uh, resource definition in the spec and click on the data type, it'll take you to its definition. I did want to just talk about our identifiers for a second. So an identifier is, is where you have, you're identifying, hence the name, uh, an object like a patient or a, or a thing inside of some given system. And there are some of the examples there, like a national identifier, driver's license is another one. Um, an identifier's got a couple of subcomponents. It's one of the complex data types. So it has the system, 
which is where it's kind of coming from. So that would be, say, driver, New Zealand driver's license or Netherlands driver's license or New Zealand national identifier or something like that. And then the value which is unique within that system. And the reason why it's worth being aware of this is it's something which is profiled really, really commonly. Most jurisdictions, uh, I suspect, are going to have a patient identifier of some sort um, and they will often put a, um, uh, put a, a, um, a, a, a specify what the system should be. So it's worth knowing about identifiers. Code data types. There are three and a half types of, uh, of, coded, data of, of coded data type in fire. The first is this code, and a code really is a simple string. Um, they mostly come from the spec, and we mostly use them for structural stuff, like a status. Um, generally, you won't do anything with code uh, systems. I think in pretty much every example, the, uh, the code binding is for code is, is required, which means you can't change it. The next, the, the next one we have is the coding uh, data type. And this is where we start to get into this concept of being able to refer to a terminology of some sort. And what you'll see in that example there is this one comes from um, Rx Norm, uh, which is a, a US uh, medications terminology. And so you see the system identifies what the actual uh, terminology is. The code is the unique concept within that terminology, and the display is what the terminology calls it. It's quite important that display is what comes from the terminology. And then the next one down is the codable concept, and that's actually made up of any number of codings plus text. The codable concept is far and away the most useful coded data type that you will come across. You'll see it used quite a lot. The reason why it's so useful is it allows you to express the same concept in different terminologies. So you can have the same thing. Say you take a diagnosis for um, a code for, for a condition. You could have it in both SNOMED and ICD, both on the same, on the same concept. And that helps things like mapping and such like. So if you get something in SNOMED and you map it to Loink, you can have both of those in the same resource. But the other reason why it's so useful is that the uh, codable concept allows you to have just text. Uh, and the reason why that's handy is that in the real world, right here, right now, stuff actually isn't coded all that well. Uh, so you've got a bit of a conundrum. If you want to get coded data, but you specify that it has to be coded, what you're effectively saying is, don't give it to me unless you know what the code is. And that's not fantastically great for interoperability. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to sort of start with a minimum degree of, um, of coding, if you like, and then, and then build up from that. Um, so that's the, those are the coded data types. The half that I talked about, three and a half, the quantity data type has got a uh, unit in it, and that unit in turn comes from the system, generally you can, so that's the half. Yeah, but if, if you have a coding system and a code, why do you need, for example, a display? Say again? Why do you need a display? Because the, in the, code, the, the code for part like for Snowman, if you look up the 3957, you know that it's... Correct. It's, it's optional. You don't have to have it. Okay. But what it does mean is that you don't have to go look it up to find it. So imagine okay. that you're in an instance, and all you have is C3214954. Yeah. If, yeah, what is it, it? that's true, but, but my danger is, is that people write something down that's completely different from what's in the... In that, that, well, they, they can't. Okay. In the coding, the display comes from the terminology. You're, you're not allowed to, you're okay. not allowed to put your own moment. That's the purpose of the text. Okay. And the codable content. That's a good question, it's a very good question. Because the other, other, other reason for text is that if someone's entered text into, say, a UI, and your system has coded it, and what you would do is the text would be the information that the person entered, and then the coding would be what you got out of the terminology. We had a bit of an issue with the UK, because with SNOMED, um, you can get different terms for the same code. So we've actually, the um, Care Connect profiles, we've extended it to include yeah, the I've seen, uh, I've seen term that. ID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is the fun that you get in real life, isn't yeah. it? And I think we're, we, as we work through this stuff, all of a sudden these, these things are working themselves out. Is there any support for multi-language? For what, sorry? For multiple languages? Multiple languages, that's again another really good question. Uh, moving right along. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, have, we have four in Switzerland. Yeah, not fantastically good, I think, at the moment. Yeah. Um, you can specify the language that a resource is used in overall, but that doesn't, doesn't help you a heck of a lot. It's, it's something that's worth bringing up to the spec, and I've, yeah, it, there's probably a better answer than the one that I've given you, but mm -hmm. it's not fantastic at the moment. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, if you get into coding stuff, you'll come up against the value set resource really, really quickly. It's one of the important things that you do need to be familiar with. Uh, and the value set, a context specific subset of one or more code systems. Really, really explicit. What that actually means is that you take a code system, and we'll look at that in just a second, and you say, in this particular context of use, the only question, that I, I'm an ED system, I want to call it ED diagnoses. So I'm going to create a subset out of my code system, SNOMED, and say, here are the 2,000 most common diagnoses I'm going to see in ED, I want to use these ones. You bind it to an element, so a particular element inside a resource is bound to a value set. The purpose is promoting consistency between applications, key component of, key component of terminology, and it's the sort of thing, if you're following you know, the kind of process I talked about before, you want to start thinking about uh, this and the information model side of things. Are, are, are you, you're obviously from the UK. Are you coming to the seminar on um, Tuesday? Uh, Keep next seminar? No. no. might want to think about it yeah, if you yeah. can. It'd be great to see you there. Yeah. Um, because we're going to be following this thing through that, that, that thing. Um, so, so because the value set, again, thinking about that it's the clinician who has got an idea of what sort of information they want to share. It's not, it's not the techie guy, the clinical guy. So the sooner you start, and I use guide, by the way, in a gender neutral um, term, just as a New Zealand thing, you know, we use guide. Um, so the value set is used by a number of services. This is an example over on the right hand side there of what a value set could look like. This is, this is geek speak here, this is um, Jason. But it's actually not that hard to follow. It says at the top there's a value set, and then it's composed of stuff which includes the system, which is SNOMED. And again, you can see that by using URLs, as we have done in Fire, it makes it easy to understand. Anyone can figure out that this comes from SNOMED. And then it's saying the property is what's called an ISA, and it's that value there. So what this means is that this value set contains all of those elements from SNOMED which have a ISA relationship to that particular value. You don't need to know any of this stuff. Um, it just looks kind of fun, so I put it up there. But digging into terminologies a little bit further and how the value set and all that stuff actually works. So there's two key concepts you need to have. The first is the code system. And the code system is where you actually define what a concept is and what something means in that, in that concept. And SNOMED is a good example of that, but there are others. ICPC, uh, READ in the UK is another one, custom things, whatever. So that's where the actual definitions of a concept a a actually occur. And what you then do is you then create a value set, and that value set selects from that code system. And if you remember that example I've just shown you, we pulled stuff out of, uh, out of SNOMED. A single value set can call stuff out of multiple code systems if you wanted to. So you're not limited to a particular code system. And then what you do is in your, in your profile, you then bind the element to that value set. So again, if we take the example I'm, I'm using of, 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 the, of the condition resource uh, and the code on the condition resource, we then say, well, in our use, and Care Connect for, for, uh, as an example, um, we are going to get the codes out of uh, SNOMED, which are in this particular hierarchy. And there's a really important concept here, and that is binding and binding strength. So the binding strength is it effectively it says, can I choose something outside of that value set? Or how strongly do I feel about choosing something from that value set? And there's four different levels. Um, there's required, which means it has to come from this value set and cannot come from another. There's preferred. There's one other which I can never remember. And there's example. And it kind of goes down the, you know, the, the, the further up the, you are, the less choice that you have. So if you really, really want to, you can create a required binding, which means that it's got to come from that set. Be really careful if you do that, because again, you are limiting yourself. Um, the preferred, or do you remember what the other one is? Preferred or? Expandable, I suppose. Thank you very much. Um, that they're, they're, they're sort of saying, well, please, please, please use it from this set if you, if you, uh, you, know, if you can. But if you can't, then that's okay, choose something else. So effectively, you're, you're, you're indicating what you really would like to happen without preventing other stuff from occurring. So, so that, that's the binding. Uh, and then finally, inside a, an actual instance of a resource, is you then have a value 
of that um, of that element, and it still refers to the code system. And so you can sort of think of it kind of like that. But those three at the top there are sort of defining how everything works, and then that bottom one is an actual instance, a real um, a real thing. And notice how you still refer to the code system. Quite important that you don't refer to the value set because the value set is just the selection mechanism. It's the code system where it comes from. Um, Joe. Uh, I am, um, say for instance, we have, uh, we have GPs and we have hospitals delivering medication information. Yes. One does it in, uh, in AC codes and the other one does it in a GP uh, specified uh, Dutch context. Yeah. Uh, how do I handle this in the value set? Do I put both, uh, both code systems and the relevant codes in the value set? You can if you wish to. Yeah, and if I only want to have APCs in my register, do I, um, do I map them before entering the value set, or do, I, or do I have to use a concept map to use it afterwards? You, you, the concept map would be the appropriate one to use because you map between, uh, between systems. Um, inside of your value set, again, that's up to you, it's an implemented choice. One of the things, fire is, we call it a platform spec. We place no constraints on, on, on what you do. It's the profiling mechanism in place of those constraints. Um, so you might want to say in, in your example that your value set has just got your um, hospital codes, whatever they were, and the expectation is that a system is going to do the mapping from GPs into those ones first, using the, the um, content mapper. But that's up to you. You can do it either way, or you might have a single value set which has got both systems, and then you're effectively saying, well, you know, choose whichever one you've got, and then worry about the mapping further downstream. Yeah. Depends on your architecture. Yeah, I suppose it will be the last one. It's easy for clients to deliver in whatever they have. Yeah, and again, this is a really key thing. You know, um, so the fire is all about community, and fire is actually fire is about what people are doing now and helping them to do it better, to make it easy to do the right thing rather than standing up and saying, this is the right thing, you will do this or else. Because that doesn't seem to work fantastically well for some reason. So FIRE is all about encouraging people to do uh, what, what is perceived to be the right thing. Because that's the other thing. Who actually knows what is right? You know, so, until we actually start doing things and, and seeing how it works out, we often don't know. Um, right, so, um, what time do I start? How much time have we got? It's 9.45. 9.45. 40 minutes, so 10, 25. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, I mean, oh goodness. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave it alone. So, um, I'm going to, what I'll do is I'll, I'll flip past the demos. Um, if I have time in this session, I'll come back to them. But otherwise, uh, in the next session, we'll go into the demos in a bit more detail. So, what I was going to show here was just how, um, in a scenario, in a fire um, the scenario builder, as well as doing the relationships between the individual resources, you can actually add real data into them. And that adding of that real data can talk to terminology servers and do all sorts of cool stuff. So I'll, I'll show you that next. It's a, it's a, it's a fun way of doing it. Um, and equally, there's a, a value set editor in PinFire. It's a pretty basic one. It's not intended to be um, comprehensive. But it does let you look at existing value sets and at least you create new ones. Um, again, we can look at that a bit later on. But I do want to talk about extension definitions. Um, so as I've said, uh, a very key concept of FHIR is that you can add your own elements to the individual resources. So they're called extensions. There is a resource for that. It's called Structure Definition. It is the same resource that's used in the core FHIR spec. Uh, we have concepts, if I say eating your own dog food, does that either disgust you or do you understand it? You uh, okay, all right. So I don't know if it's New Zealand one or not, but it's basically the profiling mechanism uses the same infrastructure that the core specification does which I think is really quite cool. Uh, so extension definitions can be simple or complex. So you can actually nest extension definitions if you want to. Uh, it's, it's very common to have complex ones where you have a, like a, a parent extension and children below that. Um, Care Connect, for example, has got, uh, has got a few of those. Um, you can go further if you want to. Kind of advise against it. Nesting too deeply gets really hard to use. Um, the, it's a definition. It's available on the web. Uh, an extension definition is, has got what we call a canonical URL. Think of it like a, a unique ID. And in the resource instance, and this is a key point, when you create an instance of a resource that has an extension, that instance must point to the definition. It doesn't have to resolve, but it must point. You must be able to find it that way. And that's so that if you 
receive a, a resource that has an extension that you don't recognize, you can go away and find out what it actually means. There's another key point here is that we have two sorts of extensions. We have ordinary extensions and we have modifier extensions. The ordinary extension is one that doesn't change the meaning of a resource and if you don't understand it, you can just ignore it. So if I create a extension on patient for eye color and I, I send it to a system that doesn't store eye color, we can just ignore it, that's fine, no harm has been done. But if on the other hand I wanted to create a, um, an extension to use on a medication saying don't give this medication, then that's quite unsafe to ignore. Uh, modifier extensions are not common. Um, in fact, I can't off the top of my head think of uh, where they're actually being used, but they have been placed there. If, if you do have this use case, it is a way of making sure that someone has to understand what your extension means. But again, be, be cautious about that because just that, you're raising the bar to interoperability when you do that. There's a uh, extension definition editor in, um, in ClinFire that we can uh, talk about, uh, or we will talk about um, shortly, and that lets you go in and create, uh, create extensions, extension definitions, obviously. Then there's the profile. So the profile is where we start to bring all this stuff together. So you profile a single resource type, like a condition or a patient or a medication or something like that, um, defined, as I've said, by a structured definition resource, uh, same as use for core resource, that's the dog food, that sort of stuff. Um, it defines each element in the, um, uh, in the, in the profile. Now, I, I make this point frequently and I will continue to do so, but the official tool for doing things like profiling is Forge. And if you're doing stuff for real, then Forge is probably what you should be using. That's, I think, what you're using in the UK and elsewhere. Where ClinFire comes in is ClinFire is intended as an educational learning kind of tool to help people actually go ahead and build stuff. And the thinking is that it lets you take the tool, tool train all the way through to the end, and then you've got something to hand over to an expert who can go in and use the more advanced tools that they need to. So again, you know, I'm not trying to compete with Forge for a second. Um, I think we, we work together on it. And there's an example of a profile there. In ClinFire, we, um, we uh, start with a logical model on a single resource. Uh, we add elements, remove elements and such like, and I'll give you an example of that when we have the chance to do so. And then you build the profile from that. So it's a kind of automated process. Uh, as I say, build a, mo build a model, <coughs> change your model, and then generate the profile, job done. Uh, and we can look at that when we get the opportunity. I think I'm kind of catching up to time anyway. I've got five minutes, okay. Um, the last thing I do want to talk about is the implementation guide. So the implementation guide is where you bring all these bits together. So for a particular implementation, it's, it brings the, the, um, uh, brings the documentation, it brings the artifacts, it brings the value sets, it brings everything together into one place. Uh, and that's one thing that I am going to do a quick demo because it sort of summarizes stuff up. So if we go into ClinFire and make that just a little bit bigger, um, I'm actually pointing at the local happy server, which is at the moment, because I've got a copy of it on my machine. And I'm going to show you the Care Connect um, implementation guide. So this is it here. So I've only got a single set of profiles on there. So if I load that, so what this says is that for Care Connect, they've got 17 profiles, 33 extension definitions, 51 terminology items, um, and so forth. And I'm going to look at them all. So if I go into profiles here, and say, take a look at the patient profile, like that. There's actually a, uh, an issue there, but so this gives us a graphical view. So that is the Care Connect patient profile. So it shows that uh, there's the uh, patient resource in the middle there. The purple things are all extensions, and we can go and look at those, uh, those details if we wish to. Uh, the blue ones are um, unprofiled resources. So what this is telling me is that the Care Connect patient has got a reference to the Care Connect organisation. So Care Connect has profiled both of those. And I can go and look at the details if I want to. I can look at the value sets, which is actually quite useful. So I can see, for example, that there's the, um, there's the address type. So the, pa the patient's got a, an address type, there are the values of that address type, contact point used, and so forth. And you kind of flip around and you can get a feel of what's inside of the profiles. And then you look, you, oops, sorry. You can look at them in different sort of ways. You can look at them as a graph. You can look at them in a, in a tree view. Um, what's happening here? Something to 
going slow. Our table. Okay. Uh, yeah, might tend to have, a, have an issue. Um, oh, I think I'm going on for the uh, wrong terminology, so I won't go into that. But we can look at the extension definitions. So there, for example, is um, uh, what have we got here that's of use. So this is medication repeat inflammation. So here's an example of a, uh, of a, of a complex extension. There's its URL. This indicates the repeat of a uh, medication item. It's intended to be used against, say, medication statement. So if I was to go into the medication statement profile, I'd see a reference to this, um, this extension. And you can see it's got four different, um, four different children here, what they mean and what they are and such like. So that's just a way of looking at the, um, looking at the implementation guide. And it's, I think what part of the neat part about all of this is, is the way how FHIR works, is that this is just an alternative way of looking at exactly the same resources. To build this, all I did is I took the Care Connect resources, stuck it up onto a FHIR server, displayed them in a different way. It's exactly the same resources that you're using to build the official website, if you like. So it means that you can look at, look at, um, uh, look at resources in a way that suits you. And we're just about done. So, ah, tons of time. So, okay, so let's bring that all together, and that's the demo of that. Just a couple more slides, actually, um, uh, summarise. So, these are the conformance artifacts that you will come across if you get into profiling, either because you do something or because other people talk about them. The structure definition. Uh, the underlying descriptions of the uh, profiles and extension definitions. The value set we've talked about extensively defines a subset of terms. A code system is the definition of a term. Concept map is mapping between different concepts in a, in a computable way. Naming system is used to define an identifier like the NHI in New Zealand or NHS in the UK. And the implementation guide is what kind of brings everything together. So there are others, but there are the main conformance artifacts that you'll come across. Um, there's a set of exercises uh, that we've done. I'm not quite sure where the piece of paper's gone. Um, you're very welcome to give it a go either in this session, if you, I mean, this, you know, at dev days, or if you want to try it out at home, in the privacy of your own home, feel free to use so, do so. And again, this is the process which is described here, which is using a, a resource to profile, log to model. Again, we'll hopefully go over this in the next session. That is just to that is just to say, um, if you want help with anything to do with Pimfire, um, there is a topic there on the, in the uh, main chat application that, that I monitor uh, quite closely. So if you, do, if you do have issues or you have questions, just go onto that chat and you can certainly see it there. That is where you can get more information. Um, there's various links to various resources, and I believe that that is it. <laughs> Thank you very much.